Welcome this evening to the uh, Legacy uh, Project. Um, glad you're joining us again. And uh, to this evening, we're looking at the great doctrine of doctrines of justification and adoption. So we'll um, think about that, but let's pray first. Father, we thank you that uh, we can take time, uh, come apart, um, separated, but yet uh, all focusing on the same thing uh, this evening to study this great truth um, that is laid out in the 1689 Confession, but more importantly, it's from your word, from scripture. And as we come to it, Lord, may it warm our hearts as it warmed John Wesley's when he heard these truths being uh, spoken of at uh, Aldersgate Street and uh, testified afterward that his heart was strangely warmed and he knew that his sins, even his, were forgiven. And may we know the reality of that, uh, not only in our heads, but in our hearts. May it transform our lives, uh, we pray. And so Lord, we can commit ourselves to you tonight and uh, solve our discussion and give us clear minds and warm hearts. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Amen. Well, we're looking at, uh, as I say, justification and adoption, two um, <coughs> very, mostly related doctrines, not, not, not identical. Um, um, the 1689 actually confession, along with Westminster Confession and so on, is quite unique in having a separate chapter in adoption. And it seems that that was a very important uh, doctrine um, to put into a confession of faith that people want, really want to articulate that. We'll look at that a bit later um, after we look at <clears throat> justification. But just looking um, at our elder statement of faith, it uh, just gives a, a good definition of justification. Then we're going to unpack that with the uh, 1689. Uh, we believe that the great gospel blessing which Christ secures to each, to, to such as believe in him, is justification. The justification includes the pardon of sin and the promise of eternal life on the principles of righteousness, that it is bestowed not in consideration of any works of righteousness that we have done, but solely through faith in the Redeemer's blood, by virtue of which faith, uh, by, which, by virtue of which faith is perfect righteousness is freely imputed to us of God, uh, that it brings us into a state of most blessed peace and favor with God and secures every other blessing needful for time and eternity. So that's making big claims to this doctrine of uh, justification through uh, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It, it, it's, uh, there, it's a great gospel blessing, um, which it's uh, really at the heart of the gospel. And we lose justification through faith in the way that this statement in the 1689 and other evangelical and reformed statement of faith, statements of faith, uh, put it. We really lose the gospel. We don't, we, you have justification by faith is really central. Uh, to uh, a, a clear understanding of the biblical doctrine of justification. And um, as it just says, it says there, it brings us in, the doctrine, as we trust in Jesus and we're justified, we're brought into a state of most blessed peace and favor with God. So that's ultimately what is people want, what we want, to be in a state of blessed peace and favor with God. If we're not, we're lost and on our way to hell, uh, but uh, we want to have that and experience that, that this peace uh, and favor with God. And not only so, but it goes on to say, this, it, this, the justification secures every other blessing needful for time and eternity. So that's a massive claim, isn't it? That um, every other blessing uh, that comes in the Christian life comes because we're justified through faith, both for this life and into eternity. So it's a really, really important uh, doctrine, which is why Martin Luther, who in uh, sort of slowly, by God's grace, stumbled into the doctrine of justification, uh, said it was a doctrine by which the church stands or falls. Um, in other words, he was sort of saying, look, if the church loses justification by faith, it falls. It's not a true church. And he said that the Roman Catholic Church of his time, from which he was expelled. Um, and, uh, and we're going to think more, a little bit more about uh, that. Uh, but a, church, a gospel church, a, a true church, will have uh, understand justification through faith um, alone. I have a, sta a statement right at the end by... Um, by uh, uh, Martin Luther. Uh, we'll come on to that a bit, um, a bit later. So it's a really important doctrine. So let's move down into uh, just the 1689 and the uh, ch uh, chapter 11, the first uh, paragraph, which gives us a great definition. And I'll just read it out. Uh, Those God effectually calls, he also justifies. He does this not by infusing righteousness, righteousness into them, but by pardoning their sins and accounting and accepting them as righteous. He does this for Christ's sake alone and not for anything produced in them or done by them. He does not impute faith itself, the act of believing. 
or any other gospel obedience to them as their righteousness. Instead, he imputes Christ's active obedience to the whole law and passive obedience in his death as their, as their whole and only righteousness by faith. Uh, this faith is not self-generated. It is the gift of God. So there's a, this is a great definition of, um, of justification through uh, faith. Now, it begins by saying that those whom God effectually calls. We're going to come on to that next week, actually. And that means the effective call that God, through the gospel, calls people and gives them life, uh, brings them to himself. Uh, that comes uh, first. So if you go to Romans, um, we'll be in Romans. You might want to keep your finger um, finger there in Romans because we'll be going through it quite a lot. Uh, Romans chapter um, uh, eight, uh, verse twenty-eight. Uh, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him and have been called according to His purpose. For those who God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Now we're going to unpack all those other terms um, of uh, uh, being predestined and called and so on. But those God calls through the gospel effectively so that they come to faith and trust in Jesus are justified. And uh, that's what we're thinking about uh, this evening. Now, the... Um, these, the statement goes on to say he, God does this not by infusing righteousness into them, but by pardoning their sins and accounting them and accepting them as righteous. Now, behind that idea of infusing is the Roman Catholic understanding of uh, justification. Basically, in the church, Roman Catholic Church is taught uh, that God infuses his righteousness. He almost is as if you like, he gives us a spiritual injection. You know, we're all waiting for this vaccine and, uh, and we'll get a vaccine infused into us. But, um, uh, that's basically what a Catholic understanding of uh, justification is. It's an infusion of righteousness, something that God puts inside of us. That, and effectively, what he does is makes us good. And then on that basis, he justifies us. He, 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 he infuses, the, he changes us from the inside, and then we're justified. Now, that's the Catholic Church's sort of understanding of justification. And that's where the big dividing line between uh, Protestant evangelical Protestant Christianity and Orthodox Catholic Catholicism. Um, because what we're going to learn is that justification is something totally done. Uh, the, the righteousness of Christ is totally outside of us. Luther called it an alien righteousness, something that's outside of us. It's not inside us. It's outside of us. We can only be justified if we have the righteousness outside of us in Jesus Christ, not inside of us. Because if you get it in, if justification is based inside of us, it becomes something that we do, something that we are. Uh, we're justified for because we're uh, good people. God makes us good people, and then we're justified. And that's, that's not what the Bible teaches. And, um, and the practical implication of that for Catholics is that you have no basis for assurance. Because if it's all something inside of us, we can look inside of us and we see it, ooh, we're all messed up. And you can never have any confidence, any certainty that you are accepted by God and forgiven by him. Because we all know that we're sinners. And, you know, and, and, um, I mean, Catholics have this idea that eventually some people become saints and they get to a higher level than everybody else. But um, it, that's unbiblical as well. Um, but so behind this, when it says he does not infuse this righteousness into us, but rather he pardons our sins and accounts us and accepts us as righteous. Um, that's the core thing of what justification is. The pardoning of our sins and then accounting and accepting us as righteous in the Lord Jesus uh, Christ. Um, so justification is not just our forgiveness. It is that, but it's more than that. We're accounted righteous. We're uh, reckoned or declared righteous uh, by, um, uh, by God. And that comes out really clearly. So for example, you go to Romans chapter four, um, which we read last Sunday, actually. Uh, uh, it's talking about Abraham and his faith. Um, uh, just verse three, what does scripture say? Abraham believed God. Well, sorry, verse one. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, um, our forefather, according to the flesh? So Paul's just been talking about how we're justified. Verse uh, 25 of uh, Romans, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received through by faith. He did this to demonstrate his, right, his righteousness because in his forbearance, he left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies 
those who have faith in Jesus. So what justification is, is a grand demonstration that God is, the, God is just and the one who justifies, that he's just in punishing sin, but he also justifies those who trust in Jesus. And he's just because Jesus has taken the punishment that we deserve. And therefore on that basis, that his atoning sacrifice, we can, be, we can have our sins forgiven and be accounted righteous and accepted uh, by uh, God. And so he goes down in chapter four and says, now to the one who works, wages are credited as a gift. Um, so I, have to, I misread that. Now to the one who works, wages are not cr accredited as a gift, but as an obligation. So when you get your pay for whatever your work you do, it's not your boss being nice to you and kind to you. He's sort of pay, giving, he's fulfilling an obligation. Um, but that's not what justification is. We haven't done anything to earn it. However, to the one who does not work, so he does not work, we don't do anything, but trust God who justifies the ungodly. Their faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not, who will never account against him. So God doesn't justify people he's infused righteousness into and made into good people. He justifies ungodly people, wicked people, um, uh, on the basis of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ and his atoning, um, uh, atoning death on, on, the, on the cross. And that's really at the heart of what uh, justification is all about. Um, but God does this uh, for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ alone, not for anything produced in us or done by us. We're, it's nothing that we could do. Um, it's not by our righteous acts. Um, again, there are lots of places in the New Testament to point that out, but let's say, for example, Titus chapter 3. Um, Titus chapter 3. Uh, uh, but when the kindness of, and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Christ, Jesus Christ, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. It's not for anything we have done, uh, not for anything in us, not for any work, no matter how hard we try. That was what Luther tried to do. He tried to work really, really hard at being religious, and he could get no peace of heart, mind or uh, soul. He did everything. He went to Rome, went on pilgrimages, fasted until he was utterly sick and emaciated, uh, and it was only when where as he was studying Romans uh, to prepare lectures for his students in Wittenberg, that he came to those words in Romans chapter one, uh, uh, verse 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God uh, is revealed. And what Luther always said, when he ever read that word righteousness, he thought it was something God demanded from him and it depressed him. But then he realized it's actually a righteousness that God gives, something that he gives us, not because of anything we do, but out of his mercy and his grace and love. And for that, Luther, that was the, the light bulb moment that switched. He suddenly saw that it just is what the truth of justification through faith and the rest is history. The Reformation begins to unfold that spreads uh, throughout um, uh, Europe. And um, in doing this, um, uh, it, um, it says there, he does not impute faith itself, the act of believing, or any other gospel obedience. So it's not our faith that justifies us. You know, we're justified. It's, faith is simply the instrument, the, the means by which we receive what God has done. It's in the open hand that receives uh, from God his gift of righteousness in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it's not as if faith is a work that we do. Uh, in fact, Paul says in Ephesians, you know, it's, it's faith is a gift of God. Uh, God enables us by his grace, calling us to believe. And it's through that faith he gives us that we receive his gift of uh, righteousness in the Lord Jesus uh, Christ. So it's not faith, our faith. Uh, I sometimes like prefer talking about justification through faith, not by faith, as if faith is the means. Faith is simply, you, you, if you almost get substitute the word faith for Christ, we have Christ when we have faith. If you have faith, we have Christ. And it's by Christ we are uh, justified. And nothing that we have done. It's all that he um, ha has done. And it's nothing else. No other, it says here, no other gospel obedience. It's not because then we become good people and we're justified because we start living a better life. It's No, it's totally on the basis of what Jesus has done 
and nothing that we have done before we became Christians and nothing we have done after we become Christians. It's totally on the basis of what uh, Jesus has done. And at the heart of it is this idea of imputation, that is crediting. It's like, you know, money suddenly being credited to your account. You didn't earn it, but someone wants to make you rich. So suddenly you find in your bank account that you're a multimillionaire. Where did it come from? Well, some money was credited to your account. And that's really what God does with the righteousness of Jesus. He credits it to our account. He imputes that righteousness to it. And it's described here as an act of obedience to the whole, the, what, the, the righteousness of Jesus that's credited to our account is an, his act of obedience to the whole law and passive obedience in his death um, as, the, uh, uh, as the whole and only righteousness by faith. So we have the idea of um, an active obedience of Jesus and his passive obedience of, of Jesus. They're not turned of two different obedience. They're sort of two sides of the same coin. They're two um, aspects of the same thing. The passive obedience of Jesus is his atoning death on the cross. He was passive. Our sins were laid on him, as we're told in Isaiah. Um, all, we, all we like sheep, you know, have gone astray. And as Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter uh, 53, um, Isaiah, ooh, let me just get here. It takes me longer to get there. Get there. Um, uh, yeah, he was pierced for our transgressions. Uh, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds we uh, were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. He just turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's his, the, the passive obedience of Jesus. He'll be, he's obedient unto death on the cross, and he, 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 sins were laid on him. And of course, the big, great picture in the Old Testament is of the goat, one of the two goats on the Day of Atonement, and the sins of Israel are confessed unto one of the goats. One slain, blood sprinkled, the other sins confessed on and sent out into the wilderness to take away those sins. And that's the passive obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we receive that in our justification. But we don't only have the passive obedience of Jesus, we also have his active obedience, that his, his, he actively obeyed the Father in everything. He actively all his life. So he was the perfect unblemished Lamb of God. So when his, he went and the sins were laid on him, he had actively obeyed and fulfilled the law um, of God. And so the, what this deals with, the, if you like, the passive obedience of Jesus deals with the guilt of our sin so that it's atoned for and taken away. And the passive obedience of Jesus means that we have a positive righteousness before God, we, that we, 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 we ha he, he, his obedience is our obedience. Uh, his perfect record of obeying God is our perfect record now. And so, and that's, and it's because of, that's what it means to be justified. We receive through faith, we're declared righteous to have the perfect, our sins forgiven and to have the perfect record of Jesus. And so that, and the father accepts us on that basis, not on anything we have done, but what has, Jesus has done in his passive and active um, obedience. And the faith by which we receive this, it's not something we generate out of ourselves, have to work ourselves up to believe. It is the gift um, of, of God. And so you have this really important thing. I think it's really important to understand this idea of being declared righteous on the basis of uh, the imputed righteousness, the credited righteousness of Jesus. Uh, a couple of verses that sort of bring that out. Um, again, Romans chapter uh, 5, Romans chapter 5. So in Romans 5, Paul is sort of contrasting Adam and Jesus, the first Adam and the second Adam, or the first Adam and the last Adam. And uh, he's, he's contrasting uh, them. Uh, let me just pick up at verse uh, uh, 16. Nor can the gift be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin, that's the sin of Adam, and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses. I mean, think of all the trespasses of people through the history, all believers, and brought justification. So the condemnation, Adam, condemnation, Jesus, justification. In Adam, we're all in Adam, we're condemned. But if we trust in Jesus, we're justified. Justification is the opposite of condemnation. For if the trespass of the one man so if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? 
Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act, that's the act of Jesus, his toning death on the cross, resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, Adam, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. You see the contrast. We are made righteous, we're declared righteous uh, on the basis of the finished atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, just one other uh, verse is uh, 2, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 21. Uh, God made him, that's Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us, so that, we, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And this is what Luther called the sweet exchange, that Jesus is made sin and takes our sin and is condemned for it and uh, dies in our place, offering himself as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And then when we trust in him, his perfect righteousness is given to us. So we are made the, right, the righteousness. We become the righteousness of God. We receive the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ through faith. And on that basis, we're accepted by the Father. And have a, and that's we, if we go back to that first, uh, just back to the first thing, as it says up uh, first, the first statement, yeah, that we can, we're in a state of most blessed peace and favor with God. It's because of what Jesus has done. We're not condemned. We're justified, declared righteous, forgiven, accepted by the Father on the basis of what Jesus did, his atoning death, his perfect life. And now we are justified and declared righteous by God. Okay, it's a great, glorious truth. Any comments, questions? Anyone wants to? Uh... Yeah, I got, I got a question. Yeah, David. Yeah. Um, actually, we uh, in, in Christian Union, we done Romans chapter five today as well. Oh, good. So, good, good. good thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, thanks to you, and thanks to Neil as well, um, and thanks to God. We, I, I, I realized that, of, of course, this. Um, uh, the the um salvation you can't lose your salvation yeah so i, I was i was i was um teaching this today um but the, the question that i have is um <clears throat> where is the sort of like the, the will of god right so of course the will of god will always prevail um where is the will of for example with the christian the christian um so for example we we, we still um follow the bible and everything uh, so where my, my question is like where where the the will of a person goes in with the will of the father or like if if the will of the person can contradict to the will of the father does that make sense yeah yeah i mean yeah so when you become a christian i mean you have a will before you become a christian our will is you know we we, we don't want to do god's will we're, we we're, we can't submit we don't want to submit to god's law where he reveals his will for us so and we're rebellion against God. But what he does, and what we'll be thinking about when next week, actually, next or next time, not next week, but next time, through the call or giving us new birth, new life, God changes our hearts. So we have, he gives us a will, a desire, and ability now to do his, his, his will as revealed in his law. Uh, Jeremiah 31, 33 says, I will put my law in your hearts and in your minds. And we're looking at Ezekiel. God says, I'll give you a new heart instead of your heart of stone, so you will obey my law. So we, we now have a new will to obey. And, um, and so that's set free. The thing is, we're still in the flesh. We still have indwelling sin. And therefore, our will, you know, we're still tempted by sin. And we, there's still a battle going on and a struggle going on in the Christian life. But the, we have the Holy Spirit as well, as we were thinking a couple of weeks ago from Ezekiel. And the Holy Spirit is there to help us and strengthen us um, uh, and uh, in and you know he gives us grace to to say no to sin and say to say yes to righteousness and to live a good life but we're not going to be perfect in this life and we're always sinning every day we're going to actually come on to that uh, just a, in a few minutes you know the reality of still sin we need forgiveness we need to confess our sins um and so really in this life the for the christian is really it's a, it's a it's a constant struggle to align our wills with god's will <laughs> you know and uh and uh, we, God we, reveals his will in the Bible. We simply, we need to live it. But because of indwelling sin, we still are tempted by the world and the flesh and the devil's subtly set, tempting us. And we have to constantly struggle and fight against that. Um, but when we get to heaven and glorified, 
our wills will be perfectly in line with God's will and we'll not be sinning. <laughs> we won't <laughs> sin after that, you see. But until then, we do, we will. And, um, and that's part of what the Christian life is, living in this fallen world with still our um, sin, the still indwelling sin in our hearts. Uh, we have to have that, that struggle go on right to the end. Anyone else? Or David, anyone want to come back on that? Uh, no. Yep, thank you. Someone else? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yeah, who's that? Karina. Uh, oh, Karina, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure if you're going to touch uh, here or maybe in another session. Uh, which is your understanding about... Um, please help me if my English is not good to define that. It's like um, uh, there is a sin that can't be forgiven because it's against okay. the Holy Spirit. Okay, yeah. Will you touch that here? Or maybe uh, well, I, I, I might, but I might as well deal with it now in a brief way. <laughs> you, okay, several... Briefly, if you can explain that. Yeah, I think very basic. Jesus, Jesus, in a couple of places in the Gospels, uh, the same incident, but reported in different ways by different writer, different gospel writers, says, you know, if you know, sin, you, anyone can sin against him, but if you sin against the Holy Spirit, you can't be forgiven. And um, I, now I, th I understand that to mean, um, when you take all the teaching of the Bible together, that, uh, that there's not some terrible sin that we somehow could find ourselves committing that will put us beyond God's grace, okay? What I think the sin against the Holy Spirit is, is the, the final resistance and rejection of the gospel because the holy spirit bears witness to jesus now we can like paul and other people you can you can blaspheme jesus all sorts of things like that and be forgiven and accepted but the holy spirit if we reject the holy spirit's witness to jesus finally and and and, and there's no repentance we we you have to repent in order to be, be saved and and if we reject the holy spirit's witness to jesus i think that's these sin against the Holy Spirit. So it's really final rejection of Jesus. Um, now, you know, we, and, and that's, a, that's what, you know, an unbeliever is doing because the, through the Holy Spirit's bearing witness to Jesus with the word and through all sorts of ways. And if a person constantly keeps on rejecting that at some point, you know, the, that, and when they die having rejected, the re resist of the witness of the Holy Spirit, there's no salvation because they, they haven't repented. But if we have, if, we respond to the witness of the spirit as Christians and we keep on doing, we continue to do that in the Christian life and, and repent of our sins and come back to Jesus and trust in him, walk with him and so on. Uh, I, we, there's, you know, we, we will not commit the sin against the Holy Spirit because we are trusting in Jesus. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, anyone else on that? Yeah. Yes, um, I'm just uh, struggling a little bit to understand the difference between active obedience and um, passive obedience. Maybe if you could um, rephrase where it says passive for a different word. I always stumble on that word. Okay. Yeah. So passive means that Jesus didn't do anything. He suffered. He, I mean, he offered us, he actively offered himself to death. That's his active obedience. But passively, our sins were laid on him and he suffered the punishment of, of God for our sins. So it was passive. He, 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 you see what I mean? So it's an act, active of something we do. So Jesus was actively obedient, actively obedient to death, perfectly obedient to his father all of his life. And his final act of obedience is go to the cross and to atone, to atone for sins. That's his active obedience. But on the cross, our sins are laid on him. Uh, the father lays the, our sins on his son and punishes them. And they're punished um, in, in our place. And, um, uh, and that's so it's it's if you like he was passive not active in that happening okay so it's um basically um he's passive because it's not him putting the sins on himself but it's the father putting the sins yes on or him. yeah it's not jesus I, I would probably more strictly not jesus in his humanity doing that i mean he he is god and you know and he is in in god so he he is as with the father and the son he is probably actively in one level uh, but in, he, in his humanity, Jesus uh, passively as a lamb led like a lamb to a slaughter. So, you know, Isaiah has that very picture of a lamb led to the slaughter, something passive. A lamb's not doing anything. Lamb's being led to the slaughter. And then he's slaughtered and he's, he's, he's put to death for our sins. And that's the passive obedience of, of, of Jesus. Thank you. Okay, good. Anyone else? Okay. 
Well, let's then move on to the second. Uh, that's where justification is. And it's a glorious truth. Actually, just before we do that, just turn over to the, uh, just right to the end, Neil. Um, Luther's uh, statement here about two kinds of righteousness. I'll just read that. Um, and it says here, uh, through faith in Christ, therefore, Christ's righteousness becomes our righteousness. And all that he has becomes ours. Rather, he himself becomes ours. Therefore, the apostle calls it the righteousness of God, Romans 1.17. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Finally, in the same apostle, chapter 3, verse 28, such a faith is called the righteousness of God. We hold that a man is justified by faith. This is an infinite righteousness, the one that swallows up all sins in a moment. For it is impossible that sin should exist in Christ. On the contrary, he who trusts in Christ exists in Christ, is one with Christ having the same righteousness as he. It is therefore impossible that sin should remain in him. The righteousness is primary. It is the basis, the cause, the source of all our own actual righteousness. For this is the righteousness given in place of the original righteousness lost, by Adam, lost in Adam. It accomplishes the same in that original righteousness would have accomplished. Rather, it accomplishes more. Actually, we gain far more through the righteousness of Christ than Adam had. We gain, as we think last Sunday, yeah, this glorious new, inherit, new inheritance, new heaven, this new um, earth. And it all comes because we're one with Christ. We're united to Christ and united to him. We have his righteousness given to us. And uh, we have this, and, and from that comes our actual righteousness, our actual obedience. Everything else flows from being justified through faith in the Lord Jesus, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so... Uh, let's just then move on to the second uh, question here, which is um, or paragraph. Um, and it's just about faith. The faith that receives and rests in Christ and his righteousness is the only instrument of justification. Uh, yet it does not uh, occur by itself in the person justified, but it's always accompanied by uh, every other saving grace. It is not a dead faith, but works through love. So it is, as we were saying already, faith is the empty hands that receive what God has done for us in uh, the Lord Jesus uh, Christ. And there's lots of references, Romans 8, 3.28, we read earlier, speaks of faith, Galatians chapter 5, uh, verse 6, and so on, speak about uh, faith. But this faith, though, is through justify, it justifies, but the faith is never alone. And what that means is that um, it always produces, this faith is always fruitful. It's not a dead faith. Uh, if you read the book of James, uh, James is saying, we, you know, we, we think last Sunday, uh, you know, we, we need to uh, not just be um, hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And he says, if you have a faith and you say, I have faith and you do works, he says, if you have faith, it's just nothing. He says, it's just like a dead corpse. If it has no works, faith, the faith that justifies is the same faith by which we are sanctified, by which we produce good works. And so you can never just say, oh, I'm justified. And, uh, but I don't have to worry about how I live. I don't have to, I can sort of sin all I want because I'm forgiven. I'm accepted by God. No, you can't. If you have faith in Jesus to justify you, that faith will work by love, Paul says in Galatians 5, 6. It will be a fruitful faith. Um, it will be a faith that's active and does things and, and uh, wants to obey God. Um, it's not a faith that just sort of says, yes, I'm going to be justified, but I don't care about being sanctified. No, if we have faith that justifies, we'll also have faith that trusts in God to give us grace so that we become more like Jesus uh, day uh, by day. So sometimes some, there has been a sort of false teaching that has sort of sometimes said you can, as long as you just are justified, yeah, it doesn't really matter how you live. Uh, the technical term for that is called anti-nomianism, anti-lawism, um, nomos, law. And, uh, and that's a heresy. It, it, you, you can't say that if you trust in Jesus, um, it doesn't matter how you live. There will be fruit. It won't be perfect, it will be, you know, none of us have a, a perfect obedience. None of us have perfect fruit, but there will be some fruit in the life of someone who believes in, in, in Jesus. And they may struggle. They may have difficulties, have their doubts and fears, but there will be fruit in their life. Um, and uh, that's, uh, so the faith that we have is not a dead faith, but it works through love. It expresses itself through uh, love. Okay. That make, make sense. Anyone have questions on that? Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Bridget. Bridget, um, yeah. Yeah. I've, you know, when you were talking about antinomianism. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have, I haven't personally come across that 
kind of um, myself? Like what, what would be kind of, what would be the sign of okay. that belief being expressed in the modern day, I guess? I, know, it... what, I mean, the way it would be expressed is um, some people would say, well, I, 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 I was at a meeting and I came to, I put my, I, I went up front and I said, I believe in Jesus. That's all I need to do. It doesn't really matter how I live anymore. And uh, mm -hmm. so, um, uh, and it, you, it can, it's, I think it's very common in cultures that have, where Christianity is very strong. Mm -hmm. And you get a lot of people who want to claim they're Christians, but their life doesn't show any evidence that there's anything going wrong. And they don't think there's, you know, they can, um, they, you know, they can, you know, they can live in an ungodly way. And that can apply, manifest itself in lots of different ways. Um, and, sexual immorality in drunkenness in you know corruption and uh, racism you know lots of things like this now it doesn't mean the Christians don't do these things and can be guilty of them but if they do they, they will the Holy Spirit will be working in them to convict them that they're sinning and they'll come to, to repentance but people have no that it doesn't bother them whatsoever you know and they spend their life that way and so they are claim they're Christians you have to really wonder if they have real faith if it's not producing any difference in change in the way they live. That doesn't mean that we trust our, the, our, the way we live. Uh, it's an evidence that we have faith. It's not the proof, it's not the basis of our assurance. That's the basis of our assurance is Jesus and his death for us on the cross. But um, there will be evidence. Now, often it's other people who can see that evidence more than us. We look at our own hearts, oh, look at what I'm, but others will see, there's, a, there's love, there's grace, there's some, you know, person, like, you know, there's, there's that, the fruit of the Spirit is being manifested. That's what J, uh, Paul in, um, in uh, Galatians sort of saying in Galatians uh, 5. Um, so he, uh, yeah, over chapter 5, um, uh, yeah, so verse 16, he says, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what's contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh? They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not, so you do not do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious sexual immorality, impurity, and butchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. If, that, if, you're, if that's, you're doing that without any change, you're not, Paul says you're not saved, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the flesh with his sinful passions. Since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. And so, um, and so Paul's saying, you know, we have the spirit indwelling us. We're going to, we're going to have a diff. We're going in a different direction, and uh, and that will not, the the evidence of that not perfect fruit. I mean, who of us has perfect uh, forbearance, kindness, joy, love, you know, we're, we're none of us perfect, but there is fruit there in some measure uh, yeah. evident in the Christian life. And, um, and you do find, you know, um, you know, just, you can find it, I think, in some Christian circles in this country, uh, where, you know, you know, um, you, I know people, people get, they, they might be, you know, it might be the emotion of a meeting they went to that made them respond and they say they're a Christian they're not there's, there's not really any evidence there's not really any change in the way they they, they live um, and occasionally you got people who who actually aggressively teach this I mean they, they, you don't get it too much anymore but there used to be um, in the time almost in um, like if you went back to the time of the, uh, the 18th uh, sorry the 17th century there were people who very aggressively taught this uh, it's not you don't find that today as much but you just find in the way you'll find people call themselves christians but there's no evidence and they just say well just i believe in jesus that, that's all that matters i'm going to heaven well if there's no no change or evidence <laughs> you have to i think you have to have some question mark there mm. that makes sense yeah that does. thank you yeah yeah but what i would just want to say to any christian is uh, don't look at your you know our basis of our assurance is not how uh, the the perfection of our fruit or anything like that. It's Jesus. We always trust in Jesus. He alone is the one whose righteousness we have. Um, but that faith will be evidenced in some measure in the way we live. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, um, then we just move on. Um, 
uh, by his obedience and death, Jesus fully paid um, the debt of all those who are justified. He endured in their place the penalty they deserve. By his sacrifice of himself, but in his bloodshed on the cross, he legitimately, really, and fully satisfied God's justice on their behalf. And yet their justification is based entirely on free grace because he, is give, he was given by the Father for them, and his obedience and satisfaction are accepted in their place. These things are done freely, not because of anything in them, so that both the exact justice and the rich grace of God would be glorified in the justification of, of sinners. Again, it's repeating some of the things we just said already, but it's focusing on the atoning death of Jesus is the basis of our justification. God presented uh, Jesus, his son, as an atoning sacrifice through faith in his blood so that we are justified, um, accepted by God and forgiven because the righteousness of Jesus has been imputed uh, uh, to us. And that's really what, that's just underlining all that. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, um, fourth, the fourth uh, paragraph says, from all eternity, God decreed that justify the elect. And in the fullness of time, Christ died for their sins and rose again for the justification. That's taken from uh, Romans chapter four, verse 25. Nevertheless, they are not justified personally until the Holy Spirit actually applies Christ to them at the proper time. So what, when are we justified? Well, God in, in eternity determined to justify us. Um, if you go to Romans chapter eight, um, we have this sort of sweeping plan of God. Um, Romans chapter eight, uh, verse 28. Um, uh, again, for those whom God, uh, all, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. Those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many uh, brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. So from eternity, God's planned our justification and uh, sent his son, Jesus, to make that possible. But it's only when we actually believe. That's what this paragraph is saying. It's only when we actually believe that we're justified. It's when we trust in Jesus, then we are declared righteous by uh, God and uh, forgiven by him. So it's, we're justified in time, though that's justification is planned in uh, eternity. And then uh, paragraph five is really important. God continues to forgive the sins of those who are justified, even though they can never fall from a state of justification. So we can never lose our justification. Once God declares us righteous, and forgives our sins, we are justified forever. There's no, Romans 8, verse 1, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And God will fulfill his purpose to conform us to the image of his son and glorify us. Nothing can stop God from accomplishing his purpose for those whom he has justified. Um, uh, so we can't lose our justification um, in any way because it's the righteousness of Christ. If it was ours righteousness, we, we could, but it's because it's the righteousness of Christ, we can't. Um, but nevertheless, we can fall under God's fatherly displeasure because of our sins. Um, so we can't lose our justification, but when we sin, it's not as if God have, hasn't forgiven us or, uh, and justified us, but we can't experience his displeasure. It's a bit like, I, I, I illustrate it by saying it's a bit like um, when we sin, it's like a, a cloud comes between us and the sunshine of God's grace. Uh, the sun is still shining, <laughs> but... Uh, it's, it's gloomy. But when we confess our sins, the, the, the cloud removes and we experience again the sunshine of God's, uh, God's grace. Uh, we, we experience his good pleasure. Uh, but he just, you know, if we sin and, and we persist in sin, uh, he in different ways will uh, discipline us. Uh, that comes out in um, uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, 10. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we can be disciplined. Uh, his ways of bringing us back to him. Sometimes it takes, he, takes, he takes a while to do that. Sometimes it's very quick. Uh, but if we humble ourselves, confess our sins, and plead for pardon, uh, we, will be, we will be forgiven, and he renews our faith and repentance. And uh, that comes out in 1 John, um, uh, 1 John chapter uh, 1, where we read uh, verse 8. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim to, we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, and we all will sin, won't we? 
we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. So Jesus is our advocate. His atoning sacrifice is the base of our justification and forgiveness. And when we sin, we confess our sins. And on that basis, we're forgiven. Um, God is, is just, as it says here, he's faithful and just. Faithful to what he's done in Jesus, just in that Jesus took the punishment. And on that basis, we're forgiven and cleansed as one of his children. Uh, uh, and that's how we go on in the Christian life, experiencing this forgiveness and grace that we have in the, in the, in the Lord Jesus. Okay, any questions on that? Okay. Good. And uh, just the last paragraph there just says that in these ways, the justification of believers under the Old Testament was exactly the same as justification for uh, of believers under the New Testament. So uh, Abraham was, uh, Romans chapter 4 makes very clear, uh, Abraham was justified, and we have the same faith as Abraham. And, there, and he was justified through faith in the coming, in the Jesus who would come in the future. Uh, we are justified by faith in the Jesus who has come, and now is at the right hand of the Father as our advocate. And uh, so Abraham looked forward to the coming of Jesus, but trusting in that Jesus who would come, he was justified, just as we are justified. And uh, that's what the basis of Paul's argument there in Romans chapter, uh, in Romans and in, in, and in Galatians, where he, that's a big, big theme um, he's, he's trying to emphasize. Okay, good. Any questions on, on that? Any? I have a question, not yep. directly in the last point. Um, my question is, um, I guess, what does um, God see, see us as when he looks at us? Because um, obviously we're clothed by Christ's righteousness. So I guess to what extent can we say when God looks at us, he sees Jesus, I guess? Yeah, yeah he does. I think he does see Jesus. I mean, he, he obviously sees if we're, he, sees, he knows our hearts, he knows everything about us and so on. But in terms of our relationship with him, he sees us clothed in the righteousness of Christ. He, he, we, um, uh, we, and, and, and on that basis, in the, clothed in the righteousness of Christ, we can draw near to, near to him. We're going to come on to see, we're think about that actually in the next section on adoption. Um, because we are now, we, because we're justified, we are then adopted by the Father. And uh, we have kind of we can have a boldness in our relationship with him uh, because we are clothed in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus uh, Christ. Of course, he knows we're still imperfect, and uh, only one day we'll be glorified. But he accepts us not for what we are in ourselves, but for who we now are in Jesus, in our in having his righteousness, and that's what transforms the Christian life. So, again, that, that's a big difference between a, a Roman Catholic. Um, understanding of this in a Protestant one, in that uh, Roman Catholics are never sure that they can, they're accepted by God. There's always, a, that's why can, Roman Catholicism can be quite heavy, and uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, and can be quite very mournful, and so on. Uh, whereas a Protestant Christian is someone who is joyful and happy, because, you know, that's the, we've had our sins forgiven. So David, um, in Psalm 32, which Paul quotes in Romans uh, chapter 4, um, you know, he puts it like this. Um, uh, sorry, let me just find Psalm 32. Psalm 32. So this is one of, so it says, um, blessed or happy is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed or happy is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. And then David reflects on his experience. When I kept silent and my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long, for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped in this in the heat of summer. And this might have been reflecting on his sin with Bathsheba. And he suppressed that. He was trying, he didn't want to acknowledge it for a long, you know, for several months. And then, um, and he, you know, he's wasting away. It's, it's, he's groaning. And that's the experience. If we don't confess our sins, we, we start to really feel that emotionally. But then verse five. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. And therefore let all who are faithful pray to you while you may be found. And so J David rediscusses the, the joy of his salvation. Um, and the, ends, the, the Psalm ends, rejoice in the Lord 
and be glad you righteous. Sing all you who are upright uh, in heart. And so as when it comes, to, justification gives us great joy and, and confidence with God um, uh, because we are in him and have know that the father accepts us for Christ's sake, not for who we are in ourselves. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, I'd love to find, I did probably sort of like this lovely definition of the gospel by William Tyndale, uh, but he says something like the gospel makes a man leap and jump and sing and dance for joy. <laughs> so he goes, it's a, it's, it's, he knows forgiveness and acceptance with God and it transforms the whole way. We still have a reverence for God and, a, um, and so on. Um, but, uh, uh, and a, you know, a sense of who he is and what it means for our sins to be punished, and yet also a joy at the same time uh, in God. Ken, okay. can I ask a quick question? Yep, who, who's that? Dan. Oh, Dan, hi, yep. Ken, um, in God's mind and purpose, what would the main purpose of sanctification be? Since our position is in Christ, yep. justified, but I know he's shaping our, our character and he wants us to, um, be a witness for him and share the and share the gospel and so i'm just curious when we take our last breath he makes us he he glorifies us yeah. is there a big gap between we all missed the mark so far so what sanctification doesn't take us to to uh oh. glorification he does that so he does yeah but, but sanctification is the fruit of our justification that we we trust in yeah, so justification true. therefore we will be Increasing sanctified, and that's just another way of saying we become more and more like Jesus, but not perfectly. And um, and uh, as you say, at at death, and we'll all be at various points of sanctification. At the point of death, we're immediately sanctified. So there, again, the Catholic understanding is just you have, they, how do you fill that gap? They say purgatory. Everybody goes to purgatory unless you're a super saint. <laughs> you know, you get there very quickly, get to heaven. But everybody else has to go to purgatory, and depending on how many sins they have, they have to work that off for long period of time you know we know that justified means that we are glorified we will immediately be glorified and that's how paul in that romans 8 28 says you know justified glorified doesn't put sanctification in between so and he puts it in the past tense meaning it's absolutely certain it's going to happen and that glorification means that we'll be conformed perfectly then to the image of christ so what's the point of sanctification well um Part of it's out of our part, from our part, it's to be it's out of gratitude. We want to live oh, God. Right. We want to thank. We want to live in obedience to Him, by yeah. His grace, day by day. But exactly. we also know that I, I think uh, our sanctification also contributes to the reward we will have in heaven. Um, that you know, if we have lived the more God, the more we have lived thought to live to please God, we will have a reward. Now we won't deal with all that tonight, but. Uh, I think that means that we, it can mean lots of things. My, I, I think one way I like to understand it is that it, 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 we will enjoy heaven even more. That the, more you, the more you give yourself to be pleasing God in this life, the more you will enjoy heaven and life to come. And I, I think an illustration of that might be Anthony Hoikma, who's a great theologian on this, gave a good illustration. He says, like learning music or knowing music, um, you can enjoy a beautiful piece of music if you know how to play the instrument and know how to play it really well, you'll enjoy the piece of music even more. If like me, you can't read any music, you still can enjoy a beautiful piece of music, but I won't enjoy it as much as someone who really works hard at understanding it and playing it and practices all the time. And I think that will be true in some degree in heaven. Uh, I can't understand how anyone could enjoy a piece of music more, but they do. <laughs> I'll enjoy So when we get to heaven, we'll all enjoy heaven perfectly as much as we could possibly conceive it. But you could enjoy it more if you really, the more you live to please God in this, in this life. So that's how I understand reward in heaven. Um, it's an illustration. It's not perfect, but. Uh, yeah, I was curious whether that was part of it. It was, it was because we play a part in our enjoying God. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in yeah. Now and in eternity. Yeah. Thank you. What was Anthony Hoipner? Hoikma, H H O. it's a Dutch surname, H-O-E-K-E-M-A. Yeah, he's written a, several books really great books the two of the, two of them one on one of them is on um uh, uh saved by grace which is deals with all this sort of subject and the other one is called the bible in the future which is about the future things okay 
So let's just look at quickly um, adoption. Um, I have to carry over a bit of this next time. If you don't mind, uh, just a few more minutes. Um, and just a quick question. Yep. Those books by Anthony Hoekma, Saved by Grace and the Bible and the Future, or in the Bible future? and the Future. Yeah. And it's H O E K M A. H O E K E M A. Yeah. Anthony Anthony with T H. Anthony Hoekma. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm just putting that in the chat. There you yeah, go, everyone. Yeah. He's, he's great. Uh, great. Uh, really good books. I, I they were some of my favorites. And I found I found that quote by Tyndale. Oh, good. Do you want to put I, it up? Or have I it? sent it to your WhatsApp. I can put it. Um, I can put it well, up I can on put the it screen. On my, sure. my WhatsApp. Oh, right. Where's my uh, phone? On your phone. Somewhere here. I lost the phone. Um, I can put it in the chat as well. Yeah, put in the chat. It's great, Jim. We'll, I'll... Okay. Let's just look at the adoption. And um, just uh, one paragraph, one in the, chapter 12. And it said, God has granted all those who are justified, in the way we've been thinking about, would receive the grace of adoption in and for the sake of his only son, Jesus Christ. By this, they are counted among the children of God and enjoy the freedom and privileges of that relationship. They inherit his name, receive the spirit of adoption, have access to the throne of grace with boldness, and are enabled to cry, Abba, Father. They're given compassion, protected, provided for, and chastened by him as a father. Uh, yet they are never cast off, but are sealed for the day of redemption and inherit the promises as heirs of the everlasting salvation. What a glorious thing this is, adoption. You know, that being justified, we are um, uh, adopted because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there we're counted God's children. We're not naturally God's children. Only Jesus is, is naturally, is the eternal son. But we are adopted into the family um, of, of God and enjoy the fr freedom, freedom and privileges of that relationship. In Galatians, uh, Paul in Romans and in Galatians uh, has a lot to say about um, about this. Um, and what does it mean then? We, we inherit God's name. You know, we're Christians. We're the people of God. Uh, we receive the spirit of adoption. The spirit comes to live within us. So um, Romans chapter um, 8 um, Romans chapter um, 8, verse, uh, let me just find it here. Um, yeah, verse 14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Uh, the Spirit who uh, we, you received does not make you slaves so that you live again, uh, if so you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought uh, about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if you are God's children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer, share in his sufferings in order that we might also share in his glory. And so we have the spirit of adoption. We've been brought into the family of God and the spirit that comes to indwell us. And Paul has more to say about that in Galatians. Um, in Galatians uh, chapter four, um, where he uh, says verse four, but when the time set time had fully come, uh, God sent his son born of a woman born under the law to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. So the very reason Jesus comes is that we might receive adoption. Uh, it's almost the reason why we're justified. It's almost something more beyond justification that we might be received the adoption to sonship because you are sons. God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. And so this is a glorious privilege that we have as uh, Christians. And as such, this privilege involves access to the throne of grace with boldness. So we're able to cry, Abba, Father. We can draw near. You know, and the illustration always, you know, where, you know, Prince Charles doesn't have to ask permission to go to see his mother. He goes straight in. Well, we don't have to ask permission to come before a far greater king, um, we can draw near to the Father uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Spirit enables us with confidence to call him daddy, you know, call, you know, an affectionate term. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and there, as God's children, we are given compassion, uh, we're protected, we're provided for, we're chastened by the Father when we sin. Um, because he loves us so much, he, he chastens us like a good father will always chasten a son or discipline a son or daughter. So God will chase discipline us if necessary. And we're never cast off. We can never lose our salvation. We can never lose our adoption or our justification. We never, he'll, he'll never disown us. 
no matter how much we might sometimes displease him, he'll, we'll, he'll always be our father. And we're sealed by the Holy Spirit <coughs> for the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit himself comes and he's the guarantee that as the sons and daughters of God, we will uh, inherit uh, all that we have for salvation. So this is the glorious privileges we have as, um, as, as, as children of God. Um, and uh, we need to really relish in that. I really would encourage you just to read through those passages and, and the footnotes and, and, uh, and, and really understand more and more of what it means to be um, a, a child of God. But to help us sort of understand that, if you just turn over, or oh, sorry, go down if you have look, to the thing called the orphan versus check, or, orphans versus son checklist. Okay. And uh, what this is, is um, years, quite a few years ago, a few of you might remember this, um, we had a series of conferences at ELT with a man called Jack Miller. Jack Miller, if you know Tim Keller, Jack Miller was Tim Keller's mentor and he was a pastor. His uh, son-in-law is still a, um, is a missionary actually in London uh, here. And so his daughter lives here in London with his, his son-in-law. Uh, Jack's now died, but Jack did a series of conferences. They were called sonship conferences. And it was really to help Christians understand what it meant to be a son or a child of, of God. And one of the things he did was this sort of checklist of, the difference between an orphan and a child of God. And I think he's, his point was that many Christians live, you know, we, we know we're justified, we know we trust in Jesus, but we, we live as orphans. And he sort of quotes Jesus there, John 14, 18, I'll not leave you as orphans. With orphans sort of as if we don't have a heavenly father. Uh, but he says, we are children of God, Romans 8, 15, but he has given us the spirit of sonship and by him we cry, Abba, Father. So he, cry, he contrasts the sort of orphan versus son. I just want to go through that and just maybe just reflect on that in your own experience. Um, First, uh, the orphan feels alone, lacks a vital daily int intimacy with God, is full of self-concern. But the child of God has a growing assurance that God is really my loving heavenly father. The orphan is anxious, overfelt needs, relationships, money, health. I'm all alone, nobody cares. I'm not a happy camper. That was Jack used to say that, I'm not a happy camper. The child of God trusts the father and has a growing confidence in his loving care and is being freed from worry. The orphan uh, lives in a, on a succeed fail basis, needs to look good and be right, is performance oriented. And Christians can be like that. You, know, you, you have to always appear good. You have to be the perfect Christian, perfect you know, mom or dad or perfect whatever we're doing. Um, the, the child of God learns to live in daily conscious partnership with God and is not fearful. The orphan feels condemned, guilty and unworthy before God and others. The child of God feels loved, forgiven, and totally accepted because Christ's merit really clothes him, or Christ's righteousness really clothes him. The orphan has little faith, lots of fear, lots of uh, faith in himself or herself. I've got to fix it. And they, you know, they can manage. They can do it. I can do it. But the child of God has a daily working trust in God's sovereign plan for her life as loving, wise, and best, and believes that God is good. And so you see those sort of two contrasts. And what we have to really work out every day is to be the child of God, you know, bring that in because we, our natural tendency is to go to the orphan direction. Um, and that's the pull of the flesh. And Jack Miller used to say that at he, what he had to do every day was he, when he went to sleep at night, it was as if the gospel fell out of his head when he lay down on the pillow. So he had to get up every morning and preach the gospel to himself to remind himself that he's a child of God. And this is what he is to live this day. And it, he was a, he, he himself was trans. He you know, said he used to be as he was a pastor and a professor at a seminary. Uh, he, he pretty much living this orphan. Um, he as even though he was a very you know well known pastor, uh, and it really he had a crisis in his life at one point. Just really as he, he, he said it was a lack of intimacy with God, lack of a sense of reality in his relationship with God, and. Um, he resigned his church, he resigned his professorship and went off to spend time with Francis Schaeffer, if anyone remembers him, in Switzerland, who taught him about this idea of this being a child of God, of living in vital union with Jesus, having an intimate, loving relationship with the Father and trusting him day by day to be working in your life. And that transformed Jack. He went back, he took, his church took him back and he started planting churches and um, had a really effective ministry towards the end of his life. And, and through Tim Keller, has had a massive impact in New York and far beyond. So. I think for all of us, we just need to say where this practically leads when thinking about a justification and adoption is that we live 
consciously as children of God day by day. And we have to really be work at, working at that because it's not, you know, it's not natural. We need the Holy Spirit to help us because it's really what a Christian is. And if we do that, we just transform us. In one sense, you know, things can go wrong. Life's not easy. Challenges come along, but we, you know, we, do, we trust, we, you know, we, we trust God. If people are critical of us, we don't have to react in an angry way. We say, okay, well, but I'm, so see, practically it means I might not be accepted by the world, but I'm accepted by Jesus. So I real, that's the acceptance that really matters. It's not the world. You know, it's not my performance. It's how I have Jesus' performance. I, have, I don't have to worry about my performance. I have the performance of Jesus through his righteousness and so on. So that's really practically where it all, where it all leads. Any questions? Anyone else? Good. Okay. Well, we're going to hear a hymn. You got that, Neil? I sent you a, a, a sort of a hymn, hymn request. If you... To my email. Yeah. Okay. Just a sec. Yeah. I'll just pull that up. up. Anyway, while he's doing that, any questions anyone has? And um... Very helpful. Very, very helpful. I love, I've loved listening to uh, all of that. Very Great. Much. Yeah, thanks, John. Yeah. But it's, it's, this is the vital core of what makes vital Christianity. You see, this is the thing that makes it, you know, everything else, all that was said up to this point, I mean, it's vaguely important, but it comes down to, in terms of connecting with our lives, it's justified, adopted into this relationship. And then the sanctification, everything else flows from that on the other side. So that's why it's such a really vital, uh, vital thing. Yeah. Uh, where did you send it, Ken? I don't have anything oh. yet. Well, it is. Uh, did I send? Maybe uh, where did I put my? Um... Oh, I must have. <laughs> must have sent it. I think. Oh, I think it, it's called. It's it's the it's Grace Community Church. Jesus, your yeah. blood and righteousness. That's it. Grace Community Church. Jesus, your blood and righteousness. Yeah. That's great. I think I might, might have found it here. Just be a sec. Okay. okay. Just let me know. I think I think this is it. Just you'll see it on your screen. Is this is this what you were talking about? That's it. Yep. Okay.
You're muted still there, Ken, sorry. Good. Anyway, with not quite the same verse. The, the, lots of usually these hymns have lots of verses. They're slightly different verses as we the ones we sing. But there we are. Great hymn on the righteousness of God in Jesus, our justifying righteousness. Great. Well, let's pray. And uh, Father, we thank you for this time together this evening. Thank you that through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ we are justified. That you accept us on the basis of His finished work. You count us righteous in Your sight and forgive our sins. And we praise you for that. Not only do you do that, but you adopt us into your family making us your sons and daughters so that we can have free access into your presence and know you as our father and have the spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are your children. We thank you for all that this has, means for us as Christians. May that work out in lives, our lives. May we not live as orphans, uh, uh, even as Christians, but live um, as your children, consciously day by day in intimate dependence upon you. Uh, so hear our prayers. We ask these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.